Good morning, everyone. We're watching the numbers trickle in here. We'll start in just a moment. Great. Well, good morning. Welcome to the uh, latest program of the Green Ribbon Commission. Um, it's a GRCX event, Building an Equitable, Healthy, Climate Resilient Future for Boston, Part 3, Looking Ahead. Uh, I'm Amy Longsworth, and with my colleague, John Cleveland, we run the Boston Green Ribbon. We staff the Boston Green Ribbon Commission. Um, GRCX is an interactive virtual program series designed to support the GRC mission of accelerating the implementation of the City of Boston's Climate Action Plan. This program is the final in a series of three that explores the intersection of climate, public health, and equity. Uh, it's sponsored, the series is sponsored by the GRC uh, Higher Ed Working Group, which has as one of its goals facilitating collaborative research to promote solutions for equitable climate resilience and mitigation. The first event in this series explored the historical context behind today's climate injustices and their impacts on our health. The second program looked at current research into three specific areas, extreme heat, air quality, and healthcare. If you haven't had the chance to see either of those programs, you can access the recordings on the GRC website. Today's third program focuses on how the city of Boston implements its climate work. The city will present its vision for an equitable climate resilient future and discuss the changes that are needed in both policy and technology. But how will change be implemented exactly and what will it feel like to residents? We also are going to hear today from two experts working to address climate impacts in environmental justice neighborhoods in Boston. They'll discuss their goals, their work, their setbacks, their achievements, and what is really important to making progress on the ground. The panel will be moderated by Dr. Joan Fitzgerald, an expert in how cities can merge environmental justice planning and climate action planning for better outcomes. And then we hope to have 30 minutes at the end for Q&A with the audience and the speakers. Before I turn it over to Joan, just a couple of logistical notes. One, we are recording this session. Two, you, will, you can get the slides and the recording of the entire thing. Uh, we'll send you an email link a couple of days, within the next couple of days. There will also be a short survey so we can get some feedback from you and we'd really appreciate it if you would fill that out. Uh, if you have questions for the panelists, put them in the chat, put them in at any time. We'll, Joan will be drawing from the chat um, when we get to the Q and A's to uh, feed the questions to the panelists. And finally, please mute yourself, of course, if you are not speaking. So I'm really excited about our panelists today. Thank you all for being here. Um, and I'd like to first introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Joan Fitzgerald, who is a professor of urban and public policy at Northeastern University, one of the members of the higher ed working group of the GRC. She focuses on urban climate action and strategies for linking it to equity, economic development, and innovation. In her fourth book, Greenovation, Urban Leadership on Climate, on climate Change, um, she argues that the climate strategies of too many cities focus on random acts of greenness, love that, rather than integrated and aggressive action. She points to leading cities in North America and Europe and offers strategies for lagging cities to accelerate their action. She is working on her next book, The Struggle for Climate Justice. Uh, Fitzgerald blogs on inequality and urban climate action on planetism. And I'm now gonna turn it over to you, Joan. Thanks for uh, joining us and for sharing this morning. Thank you, Amy. It's a pleasure to be here. I have um, participated in or been part of this whole series and um, it's really been quite informative, not only on Boston, but learning from other cities for Boston. So I'm happy to be here again uh, for this very important topic about building an equitable, healthy, climate resilient future. 
So where did this all start um, in terms of, of health impacts? Well, its history is through redlining and it has left a legacy of environmental pollution which in turn has had negative health impacts. So if we look, we see the dirtiest of industrial facilities have been located in predominantly black and immigrant neighborhoods. Historically redlined neighborhoods have been deliberately exposed to sources of pollution, highways, incinerators, factories, oil fired power plants and more. The cumulative result is higher levels of polluting particulate matter in these neighborhoods. So just looking at California, the Union for Concern of Concerned Scientists estimated that African Americans and Latinos are exposed to about 40% more particular mat particulate matter from cars, trucks, and buses than whites are. In fact, one zip code is a better predictor of health than one's genetic code. This startling discovery um, by then Washington University Professor Melody Goodman in 2014 has been documented by several studies since then. After moving to NYU, her team developed what's called the City Health Dashboard that revealed life expectancy in the nation's cities varies considerably according to the lowest and highest zip codes, income zip codes. Chicago's gap is an appalling 30 years. Washington DC and New York City are close behind. They're 27 year gaps. So the COVID pandemic has further exposed the gap. Blacks and Latinos were hit with the triple whamm whammy of work, crowded housing, and health vulnerability. These combined factors can be thought of structural vulnerability that we have baked into our residential patterns. Um, and so if we look at in most cities, what we see is the incidence of cases as well as the death rate of cases is concentrated in predominantly black and Latino areas that also have the highest level of pollution and asthma. Um, we see that in the Boston area as, as well. So Chelsea was the epicenter of the pandemic. The Boston Globe reported that roughly 21% of residents in, of Chelsea had been diagnosed with COVID-19, and that's considered to be an undercount. And of course, it has the highest rate of overcrowded housing in the state, a large share of frontline workers, and high rates of asthma. So if we, if we look at that combined um, and what the relief has been from, from the federal aid, it's getting 3.9 million out of 1.9 trillion in the rescue plan while cities like Everett and Revere next door will receive 13 and a half million, 30 million respectively. So I've been working um, as an author on the climate assessment report for cities and one of the things we're doing is trying to develop a way of integrating health into our climate action planning. So if we can go to the slides, many of you have probably seen um, a Venn diagram like this that looks at the interactions between mitigation and adaptation. And what we have been doing in this is putting health into the picture because you really can't um, ignore health as part of climate action. So if you see here, equity is behind the scenes underpinning action in all three areas where um, we look at those interactions. Advance, please. Next slide. Next slide. So this is rather light to see, but I'm, I'm really not presenting today. I just wanna give you an idea of how that would look if you're looking at infrastructure, which includes energy, water, transportation, buildings, and communications. So what we're trying to do now is fill in what are the areas that are unique to each health mitigation and adaptation, and trying to think of ways to create synergies so that when we're doing work, um, we can hit as many of the three as possible. And um, I'm delighted to see that the talks that we're going to be hearing today will show us uh, ways to do that. You can, you can end the slides now. So let me introduce our panelists. 
Um, first, we have the Reverend Mary Emma White Hammond. She is the Chief of Environment, Energy, and Open Spaces for the City of Boston. She has extensive background in embedding equity and environmental justice into Boston's communities. She's the founding pastor of New Roots AME Church in Dorchester, which is a multiracial, multi-class community. In this work, Reverend Hammond White utilizes an intersectional lens to connect ecology, immigration, climate change, energy policy, and economic justice. So she has every area of my, of my diagram covered. She is a fellow with the Green Justice Coalition, which brings together eight social environmental justice groups from around Massachusetts, and has received numerous awards for her work, including the Barr Fellowship, the Celtics Heroes Among Us, the Roxbury Founders Day Award, and the Boston NAACP Image Award. She was selected as one of the Grist 50 Fixers for 2019 and Sojourner's 11 Women Shaping the Church. She will be talking about Boston's work to address heat islands. David Queeley is director of the Eco Innovation District at Codman Square Neighborhood Development Corporation, where he oversees efforts to engage the community, set the vision and goals and fundraise to establish a, a transformative multi-faceted neighborhood scale eco district in the Talbert Norfolk neighborhood. He has more than 28 ex years experience working with communities, neighborhoods, funders, and state and federal agencies. Among his past positions were the New England Regional Director of the Trust for Public Lands Parks for Peoples Program, a consultant to the Funders Network for Smart Growth and Livable Communities, Vice President and Senior Planner at New Ecology, and uh, he has also served on the Rose Kennedy Greenway Leadership Council and the trustees of the Reservation Advisory Council, as well as the Mayor's Climate Action Committee for the City of Boston. Jeannie Ramey is Executive Director of Climable.org and co-founder of Synapse Energy. She founded the organization when she realized there was a need to make technical information on energy and climate more accessible to the broader public. She is also Senior Vice President and co-founder of the energy and environmental consulting firm, Synapse Energy. At Synapse, she organized the development and achievement of current and long-term organization goals, objectives, policies, and procedures. She has been working in the energy field for nearly 30 years. Prior to founding these organizations, she served, worked as an economist in the Electric Power Division of the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities and as analysis, an analysis to TELUS Institute. So we are bringing many years of experience to this topic today um, and um, look forward to hearing, um, to hearing the presentations. So we'll start with you, Ch Chief White Hammond. Great, thank you for having me. Um, and I look forward to um, some of the time for questions and engagement uh, later on. Uh, also really great to be on this with um, Dave and Jeannie who are both um, contributed and worked with uh, our department in different ways. So I'm really glad to um, have this conversation and think about uh, even how we go deeper moving forward. So I wanna start just by noting, um, you know, when I look at the how I frame what environmental justice is, um, it's, it's really about looking at both the benefits of um, connection with our land and our environment and the burdens um, around the dis negative externalities um, is what they call them in, in, in economics. But you know, who's getting the pollution? Who's getting the toxic dumping? Who doesn't have access um, to clean water? Um, who doesn't have access to uh, cooling features like trees and, and the beach? And, um, and so it's really important that um, we look at both sides of those of that equation and make sure that there's really equity both in um, the benefits, um, how people are able to connect with the land um, and, and experience those benefits and the burdens. Uh, because I, I am of the belief that if there were far more equity of burden, we'd have um, more active climate action. Um, if polluting facilities were being cited in, um, Marblehead or Wellesley, um, you would see uh, a lot more push for clean energy uh, because 
uh, folks would really see the impacts um, in their lives. So we'll talk a little bit about what the city of Boston is doing, um, both from a mitigation of climate change and, and a, and a um, adaptation perspective, uh, because the reality is that climate change is not something that is coming, it is here already. Um, and so we both have to think about how we uh, face the reality that, that um, we are confronting and make sure that we don't make it any worse than it already is. Um, and our work in our department and part of what uh, sort of my mandate is, I've, I'm at the beginning of my seventh week now, um, is really to make sure that equity um, drives that conversation, that we really think about those benefits and burdens, thinking not just about how we do right going forward, but also how do we repair the harm that's been done in the past. So I wanna talk really quickly about four initiatives that we're doing um, that I think illustrate how um, we're trying to approach this. Um, many of you probably have heard about the work that we've done with Climate Ready Boston, which we are still doing, looks a lot at um, sea level rise, but we are now um, really leaning into over this last year, uh, a focus on heat. Um, while sea level rise is dramatic, um, while hurricanes and, and sort of tornadoes and all of those um, natural disasters feel um, pretty uh, crisis-like, the reality is the data shows more of us um, are affected by heat and the rising heat um, than are by sea level and um, some of our sort of more fantastical events um, of flooding, et cetera. And so we are starting with a look at our Healthy Places Initiative, which is a combination. Uh, my cabinet, I, I joke with folks, my cabinet includes everything from archaeology to animal control, and that is true. Um, the Healthy Places Initiative is, is a, um, a bringing together of both the health heat resilience study um, led by the environment department and the urban, urban forest plan led by our parks department. So if we can move to the next slide. So first I wanna just really take a moment really quickly to look at this heat resilience study because I think it really illustrates this question of who's getting um, the burden. So Bodice, we are developing a citywide um, solution to reduce urban heat and the heat risks, um, preparing for the reality that it's only going to get hotter. Um, so we're looking at heat adaptation strategies. Um, we're looking at these metrics of who is at the most risk for heat um, and what can we do to impact that, making sure um, that our residents are prepared. Um, heat is tough, but it shouldn't take your life. And in far too many instances, uh, we're putting folks at risk for that. Next slide. So we're focused on, um, we, we have a citywide look and we'll do that in a moment, but there's five neighborhoods that we've identified um, that have some pretty uh, strong risk around heat. And those are Chinatown, Dorchester, East Boston, Mattapan, and Roxbury. We chose those neighborhoods um, both uh, because of the level of risk that they're experiencing. And I think there's the other overlay, which is um, these are also neighborhoods where in many cases, people are living in an older housing stock, which means that even as it does get hot, um, it's highly likely they do not have um, uh, central air or other cooling mechanisms um, that would allow them to withstand the heat. And I know that because I grew up uh, in Roxbury and uh, my uh, bedroom was on the third floor and it was just rough. <laughs> Those July um, and August nights, uh, it was challenging. I did have a fan, um, but sometimes it, it never felt like uh, it got cool enough. So next slide. So this um, gives you a sense of what we're looking at in terms of heat. Um, as you can see, uh, this is the land surface temperature. Um, and you can see that as you go into um, our core, things get a little bit more challenging. Um, some of those places that you see where it stays a little bit cooler, um, you'll not be surprised to see, and we'll look at that in a moment, but you'll, you'll notice that many of those places are the places where we have um, some um, wooded and open space um, in, in large amounts still um, available. Next slide. 
So this gives you a sense of what the difference in those temperatures are. So in Franklin Park, where I uh, spend many a morning um, running or walking, um, the, the temperature at 3 p.m. can be 94 degrees. And in um, Frederick Douglass Historic District, we're talking 105 degrees. At the Chinatown Gate, 106 degrees. But then in West Roxbury, again, 95. And again, all of this is related to trees, how much density there is, how much ground versus asphalt. There's a lot of things that go into this. But um, you can move from one part to the, another part of the city and see a 10 degree difference in temperature. Next slide. And what's even more concerning is what happens in the evening. So in many parts of the city, um, it gets better in the nighttime. For instance, Franklin Park generates a lot of cooling for a good chunk of Roxbury and Dorchester, helping bring those temperatures down in the evening. But you might notice here that Chinatown, even in the evening, can be sweltering. Um, you see those 90 degree temperatures um, that are just unsustainable and hard. It's, it's challenging for folks to even sleep through the evenings. Next slide. Oh. So as this sort of names, why are some uh, uh, neighborhoods hotter or um, cooler? And this um, looks at the old um, redlining maps. Um, and uh, you know, I don't have time to go deeply into redlining. Um, if you've never heard of it, there's so many good resources that are that are out there. But basically, this was sort of real estate um, uh, folks deciding what part of the neighborhoods were worth investing in, and which were not. And you can see this color code: best, still desirable, declining, hazardous. Hazardous often meant there are a lot of Black and Latinx folks. Uh, Asian folks living there in high numbers, that's what quote unquote hazardous often meant. Declining was, was a code work for there's too many of them there. Maybe their numbers are growing. That's not where you want to invest. And so the idea of behind quote unquote red lining is that they would literally draw these red lines um, and make decisions about um, where the investment should go in the city and where it shouldn't go. Next slide. And so when you begin to look at where um, investment went and where it didn't go, there is a deep correlation between where we chose to invest, the kinds of folks that live there and um, how those investments or lack thereof play out in terms of how hot it is to live in those communities, even to this day. Next slide. So wanna, um, if this is interesting to you, wanna let you know that there are more opportunities for you to learn more about this. I, I, I gotta get to a few other things in this conversation and look forward to engaging, but we actually have some sessions happening right now uh, or right tonight um, you can see we've got a session in Mattapan tomorrow in Roxbury in Chinatown on Thursday next week in Dorchester in East Boston. Love to have folks engage. Maybe you live in one of those neighborhoods and want to come out or work in one of those neighborhoods and want to come out. If you know folks, please um, have them jump in. We want to make sure that people not just know about what's happening, but that we also can really engage them in a conversation about the solution moving forward. Uh, one of the things that Mayor Janey's really emphasized is we need to look at how we take the resources we have and invest moving forward um, in a way that, again, uh, rights some of these wrongs and protects the health and safety of our residents. Next slide. So I won't be able to go into this in great depth, but um, this is an example of one of the things that we've done um, where we found that folks had um, again, we're living in a heat island and many of them did not have um, access to cooling. We created a program that um, connected residents with ABCD um, and provided free air conditioners, fans, um, helped them learn about fuel assistance. Um, we wanted to really bring them in um, and not just to address the immediate need of heat, but also sort of help folks in a more sustained way. So you can see the list of partners, 
um, the health commission really worked with and partnered with us on this. Um, but there were a number of community partners like Whittier Street, Shirley's Pantry, um, and it was supported by a grant from our foundation. We were able to do that last year. We are trying to uh, expand that a bit this year um, as it's projected to be even hotter. We've already had our first heat wave um, uh, of the summer, um, and unfortunately, we expect quite a few more. Go ahead and next slide. And yes, I will share the link. So um, these are just pictures of that um, moving forward. One of the things that was really great is we also worked with BMC so that people showed up and were experiencing any signs of heat distress, they could actually get a uh, prescription for a, a, a fan or a, um, a AC cooling unit. Next slide. And as I said, again, one of the big questions is, where are the trees? Uh, because the trees literally are the lungs of the city. They clean the air and some of our communities where pollution is a big issue and they majorly contribute to cooling our um, community. So we want to um, really make sure that we invest in trees. Um, and so there's a work to this currently to uh, plant 2000 trees a year. Um, and we're, we're working on that, mostly street trees. But uh, we're also having a deeper conversation because even as the city is planting more trees, we're losing more trees on private property. And so we wanna be good stewards um, and, and introduce more trees, but we also need to do more work to educate our, our residents about the importance of trees and what it means when you take down um, an older tree that is really providing um, lots of support for community that folks may not even be thinking about. We've seen a lot more awareness of this, but there's more work to be done um, to make sure that all of us are working together to protect our urban tree canopy. Next slide. So another question again around this benefits and burdens is, is the reality is that all of us have not contributed equally um, to the situation that we're in right now. Um, many uh, companies and individuals have a much, much higher level of emissions um, than our most uh, vulnerable re residents, even though our most vulnerable residents are the ones paying the highest prices. Um, and so we want to um, join together and make sure that all of our buildings, which right now are, are sort of our, one of our most major contributions to uh, emissions, are moving to uh, net zero by 2050. That's the goal we've set for ourselves um, as a city. And we aren't gonna get there unless we start taking concrete steps to move in that direction. So um, yesterday uh, it was filed in the city council, um, an update to Birdo. Um, this is our building performance standard and it sets carbon top targets. So we're asking our largest landowners, our largest buildings to say, okay, if we're gonna get to 20 2050 and be a net zero city, what do we need to do over every five years to really get there. And this um, creates pathways, a number of different pathways um, for companies to join the city in bringing down our emissions um, overall. And, and it's improvements folks can make internally, there are improvements they can invest in externally. There's a, there's a number of different ways that, that um, building owners can uh, participate in this. But we're really excited because we feel like ultimately, um, some of us who have more resources have got to um, contribute and, and we can't just keep talking about climate shifting. Um, we can't, and it can't just happen with the city. It's gotta be an all hands on deck, every building, every community, every resident um, together pulling our weight. But we're starting with our largest buildings because um, their participation will make the largest impact. Next slide. So we, you know, spend some time before we launch this really hearing from folks, what did they want? Um, and this is what they raise. They want carbon reduction that improves air quality. Um, some of our communities suffer from very high levels of asthma um, and that air quality um, really makes a difference in people's quality of life. Um, we wanna reduce renters energy bills, particularly renters because um, a lot of our renters are, are more vulnerable folks and we wanna make sure um, that, that uh, we're not allowing um, energy bills to be the kind of thing that leads people to eviction or um, has people living in stifling ways within their home. We don't want to contribute to displacement. 
clearly that is a huge challenge in the city of Boston. I could go on about that for a while. We wanna improve heating and, heating and cooling in homes. And that's both by increasing efficiency, but also making sure that folks have access to the kind of cooling mechanisms they need. Um, creates jobs for residents. Um, there's a lot of green work out there. Um, unfortunately, um, we haven't always made sure that the folks who need it the most are at the front of the line. So we'll talk about that in a, a moment and is good for the environment. Next slide. These are a whole bunch of things and we can talk about how we move forward. These were some of the actions that people started thinking through and some of the things that we um, may, may be able to move forward as um, we work with our larger buildings. There's also an investment fund that's part of that work that um, can help us do even more decarbonization. Don't have time to go through all of these, but these are examples. There's lots of ways um, that we can move forward. Next slide. And I want to recommend this. We don't have time to show the actual video, but one of the things that we thought about is, you know, a lot of times these conversations are super wonky and we're talking about parts per million in the atmosphere and, you know, what can we do with heat pumps and where are they compatible? And um, that doesn't always get to people. And so one of the things that we did is this project, um, partnering with artists um, to help uh, create art that reflects the um, aspirations of folks, what they hope for our city and how we begin to move forward and how we become a more sustainable, just city. Um, and so uh, we can also go ahead and put those in the chat so that folks can, can access those videos. Next slide. And again, as I said, with this question about equity, who gets the benefits and who gets the burdens and what we what we um, named is we talked about this healthier climate. That's a lot of the mitigation work that we're doing. Um, better buildings that come out of this. Um, these buildings, if we make these upgrades to our building, we will not just reduce emissions. We have the opportunity to make buildings um, sort of less leaky in terms of being cold in the winter and, and hot in the summer. And that actually improves the, the health and safety and comfort for the folks that are living there. Um, we, Things that we do to upgrade our HVAC systems and make the, our air cleaner obviously make a difference. And then we also have this focus on jobs. Next slide. Um, we, I, I will breeze through these. This is another example of how we are trying to engage community. The clean air grants, again, an opportunity to, um, to reduce the disproportionate impact. Um, but again, they, we can talk about that later. If you're really interested in, in uh, an opportunity to do reduce air pollution in your neighborhood and you have a great idea, let's talk about it. We'll go ahead and put it in. That, that pro grant process is open right now and we're really excited. Again, we believe that all the solutions don't come from, from City Hall. Many of them can come right out in the neighborhood and this is an opportunity for us to um, bring our residents into dreaming and giving them some resources to move those forward. And finally, um, next slide, we are really working on green jobs. Um, the mayor's put a million dollars in the budget for next year. And so our office is creating a community advisory board um, to figure out how to spend that million dollars. Um, if you have a background in green jobs, um, we are seeking applications um, for that green jobs initiative, because again, um, it is so important for us to address climate change, but we also have to recognize that there's a lot of suffering that people are experiencing um, in terms of our health and our economics, our, even our ability to stay in the city. And if we don't look at those other things that people are struggling with, not only um, do we risk losing them for other reasons, but um, if we're gonna spend a million dollars, why can't we spend it in a way that both makes us more climate uh, secure and lifts folks out of poverty, that restores um, communities and address, redresses old harm. So there's a lot um, that we can do to move more intersectionally. Um, and with that, I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief Whiteham. And we have several questions in the chat, but uh, we're going to do all three speakers first. Um, and then go to questions. So let us turn to David Queeley. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Joan, and thank you, Chief. That was a great, inspiring um, talk. Um, I'm Dave Queeley, Director of Eco Innovation for the Codman Square Neighborhood Development Corporation. 
uh, we've been focusing for a number of years on the notion of neighborhood scale sustainability. So how do you improve things in one neighborhood and make it do it in such a way that it's uh, <clears throat> replicable in other neighborhoods? <clears throat> so, hold on, it's not shared. Okay. Um, so I put this slide in just because equity is at the heart of our work. And sorry, this thing's jumping all over the place. <laughs> uh, equity's at the heart of our work. And so this quote from Jane Jacobs kind of reminds me about that. Um, you know, everybody's got a, a role to play. Everybody must be part of the solutions. Uh, and I know that Chief just said, <clears throat> uh, a lot of the solutions are gonna come from, from residents. So that's kind of what we're working on. Um, <clears throat> Codman Square, it's been around for about, Codman Square NDC has been around for about 44 years. We provide, economic development, support for small businesses. We have a, um, a community organizing and resident resources department that helps lift up and uh, support residents in different ways. Uh, our asset management department and real estate departments provide affordable homeownership and rental opportunities. Uh, and my Eco Innovation District um, initiative focuses on the things I just mentioned. Um, <clears throat> we've been doing a we did a survey called Keeping Codman Square Affordable. Um, these are some of the statistics that came out of that work. And of course, um, COVID really exacerbated all of these things. We did a survey in the first month of COVID. People seem to be holding their own, but really only 30 days later, we did another survey. Many people had lost jobs. Many people had uh, health issues. Many people's partners had lost jobs. So they had no source of income coming into the, into the neighborhood, or I'm sorry, into their homes. Um, we also did a partnership with the Conservation Law Foundation looking at um, health and really looking at what's going on with health, how do residents, how can residents kind of create surveys and work with other residents and do research into their own neighborhoods to really um, support, do some findings about what was happening for them health-wise, but also support solutions. So that's still an ongoing bit of work we're doing uh, in partnership with the Conservation Law Foundation. Uh, in terms of health, we've also got a 20,000 square foot urban agriculture site, the Oasis at Baloo. Uh, we've been using that to not only grow food that we give to the community, but also work with men of color in particular who are re-entry citizens uh, or who have been um, connected to the prison population in different ways, jail population in different ways. So they've been growing on the site. I think last year we produced about 3,000 pounds of food, the idea is to double or triple that in the next year or so, and really begin to help deal with the food desert that um, is in the Codman Square area. <clears throat> the Eco Innovation District, I'll just give you a quick kind of zoom in on this. Um, this is uh, the Eco Innovation District. It's surrounded by Key Streets, uh, Talbot Avenue in Norfolk and uh, Washington Street. You can see Franklin Park and the left-hand area and then uh, upper right is Boston Harbor. So this gives you a sense of, of where it is. <clears throat> and we're trying to transform the neighborhood. This is a piece of the Eco Innovation District from something like this. We call, we call this the auto mall because there are a number of small auto related businesses uh, operating here and they're still there. Uh, this picture was probably taken I'm gonna guess about 10 years ago, they're still there, but changes started to come to other parts of the, of the neighborhood. But we still have a vision that we work on with residents, Talbot Norfolk Triangle Neighbors United is the key resident group we work with to transform this piece of the neighborhood to something like this. Um, zooming into our service area, we did some work with uh, the Nature Conservancy and I'll talk more about that in a little bit, but we started to plant trees. Chief Hammond mentioned tree planting is a critical component. So we um, gave away uh, 25 trees to residents um, in our service area. Most of them were in the uh, Eco Innovation District, but we also planted a number, I think it was about 150 trees in our properties to start to stem this issue around climate change and heat, um, <clears throat> pollution, cooling. Uh, trees help in a number of ways. They provide a number of benefits. And so this shows you the locations of uh, some of the trees that we planted. And this is a tree cover map. So I don't know if you can see the Eco Innovation District is bounded by the Fairmount line, um, uh, Norfolk Street and Talbot Avenue. This is Washington Street, but you can kind of see there's some tree cover there and there's gonna be another map later that will 
drill down on this a little bit more, but certainly not enough trees um, to help stem the stem urban heat island effect. Um, so as I said, we've planted trees. This is at our oasis at Baalu site. Um, and the two young men you see doing the shoveling here were cord involved. And we did a whole series of trainings for them around um, urban agriculture and urban forestry. And they ended up planting, I think it, they planted the 150 trees in about two weeks. So it was a pretty remarkable amount of work on their part. This again gives you more context about where we are. You can see where we are in context of other neighborhoods. And the Eco Innovation District um, is 46 acres, about 252 homes, although that's gone up a little bit, 13 blocks, 1,500 residents, and about 66% of the residents live at or just below the po or below the poverty line. The unemployment rate for men of color is pretty high, and in our service area as a whole, we only have about a 22% college graduation rate. So that gives you some context about what we're, you know, what the population is there. Um, I won't dwell on this too much. It's kind of not a great slide, but it gives you some sense of some of the other statistics in the zip code that we're in, which is 02124. Um, so we've been working with a lot of different partners. Uh, the city of Boston um, chose us as one of the first slow streets uh, Neighborhood. So what that really means is calming down traffic, slowing it down from the citywide speed limit in most places of 25 miles an hour to 20 miles an hour. Residents in TNT or the Talbot Norfolk Triangle had been advocating for a number of years to slow down traffic. This little triangle uh, acts as a cut through onto the major streets. So Darlington Street acts as a cut through from pe for people coming from Talbot Avenue, trying to get over to Norfolk Street. Um, there, were just a, there was just a lot of traffic going through this little neighborhood and people were speeding. I mean, I watched cars going 50 miles an hour down a one lane street with cars parked on both sides and residents were really adamant that someone was gonna get hit. And sure enough, uh, a young kid got hit a few years ago, they survived, but that was kind of the last straw for people. So um, timing worked out in that the city picked us uh, to work on the Slow Streets Initiative. And they did a study that really looked at traffic flows and how um, some of the streets were being used. And then implemented um, the Slow Streets Initiative. So now in the neighborhood, there are signs like you see in the upper left, it says neighborhood slow zone. Uh, marked on the street, it says 20 miles an hour. There are crosswalks. Um, there are also curb extensions to make those crosswalks shorter. Uh, we also have rain gardens now and flex posts were put in. So that work really actually just recently wrapped up. Um, and now we have also a removal of sidewalk along the Fairmont line, and that's been replaced by a bioswale or drainage swale so that once that asphalt has been removed, it's lo no longer contributing to urban heat island effect. And it is uh, a place where water, rainwater can get back into the groundwater cycle and replenish that groundwater cycle the way it's supposed to be. So that was a project that was done in partnership with uh, Boston Transportation, um, Boston Water and Sewer as well. And uh, that's a great example of neighborhood partnership and city partnership. We also started to look at the value of trees from an economic and, and climate standpoint. So you can see in the upper left, uh, gallons of water these trees take up, um, how they kind of take off particulate matter, uh, what the energy savings are from blocking northern winds in the winter and shading in the summer. So this is just for one particular tree over a, a 20 year span. But I think the number for the 25 trees in the neighborhoods came out to a value of something like $252,000 over a 20 year span. So it's pretty significant when you look at things from an economic standpoint. <clears throat> um, this shows again, the Eco Innovation District um, from a tree cover uh, perspective. So we're looking at particulate matter. So the lighter blue is less particulate matter, darker blue is more particulate matter. But you'll see in the next slide that where there is uh, more particulate matter also coincides with uh, where there's just not enough tree cover. So basically most of the Eco Innovation District has a need for tree cover. And that's partly what stimulated us to start to do the work of planting trees there. We need to do more, um, we need funding to do more, but um, hopefully more will be coming. Um, 
And again, backdrop to some of the work we're doing now, more and more people are moving into cities. So uh, you know that's happening. You know uh, that's happening from looking at uh, housing prices in Boston are starting to go up again um, post pandemic. And so <clears throat> really we started to look at how can, given all of this context, how can we start to create jobs, green jobs? Um, so we worked with the Nature Conservancy and did this resilient green infrastructure and workforce development uh, report. Uh, I can share a link uh, to it when Claire and Amy send out the post uh, meeting information. Um, this is right in the Eco Innovation District. We worked with young people from TNT to plant trees a couple of years ago. I think this particular tree needed to be staked out because it started producing so many peaches, it started to bend over uh, in the first, uh, first year. It was pretty remarkable. And I think it's still producing some great peaches. Um, <clears throat> we looked at different programs around the country. Um, DC Waters Green Infrastructure Program uh, is really a great model. Uh, we're not there yet, but we're working on green infrastructure jobs. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but the one place we're focusing right now is getting people certified under the National Green Infrastructure Certification Program or NGICP. We've had two classes so far. Uh, 19 people have taken the class. Not all of them have decided to take the exam, but of the ones that have, 71% um, uh, of them passed, uh, which is pretty good passing rate for folks who have never heard about green infrastructure before. And um, we also have three people that are now working for a green roof company, which is really the goal of all this work. Um, again, some more backdrop, Dorchester Center sits at a, right at the point of a hotspot. So that's really why we're doing uh, some of this work in green infrastructure. Um, and this is a piece or picture of the projects that we're doing. Uh, this, as I mentioned, is recently completed. So if you look at this green uh, swale at the top, this was all sidewalk originally. So again, contributing to urban heat island effect. The city has recently completed this work. Um, there's a rain garden here at the corner of Colonial Ave now. There's another one here at the corner of uh, Southern Ave and a really large one here um, at the end of Southern Ave. So water is going to be flowing into these rain gardens, into these bioswales and begin to um, return the natural water cycle, but also just start to cool things off. There are also some trees that were just planted. So you see a number of trees here, about seven or eight trees that were just planted as well. Um, and again, just to kind of zoom back out a little bit, the Green New Deal kind of looks at some of these policies and where for us, green workforce development is really a critical piece of this work. Um, we also recently received a three-year uh, Kresge grant. Um, we worked on a one-year planning grant and that led to a three-year action grant. So we're focusing on three key areas, the passage of the state climate roadmap bill and drilling down on the related sections, um, passage of the HERO legislation, which is taking a piece of we're doubling the deeds excise tax and putting that money towards affordable housing and open space. And then passage of the city's conservation core initiative. So what we're really trying to do in supporting these three things is engaging residents directly. And this goes back to the equity issue, engaging residents directly in some of these processes and giving them a seat at the table. So our process has really been to surface resident concerns around climate and see what it means to them and meet them where they are. So for example, one of our residents, we've been, we've been meeting since literally the March 10th of last year. So right when COVID hit, we have continued to meet. Um, but one of our residents is very interested in creating a green jobs pipeline from Madison Park High School, for example, through Roxbury Community College or some of the other entities, Wentworth or some other programs out there um, so that students really have, see a future for themselves. Right now, Madison Park, for example, is the only um, voc tech school in the city and so, how do we better utilize uh, that, that school? Um, <clears throat> so we're trying to support folks in prog programs like that or projects like that and help them find funding to realize those, those interests. Um, and this gives you kind of a, this is a piece of a cloud map that was done, some great work that was, was done by Wynne Constantini who just graduated from MIT. And this just gives you a piece of a sense of what the different connections are around uh, green infrastructure and green jobs and who's you know who's involved um, air quality and health we're working with harvard 
uh, on doing air quality monitoring. So again, empowering people to really gather the information that they need to ask the questions of decision makers. So purple air monitors are kind of a fixed air monitor. Uh, mobile monitors are part of a grant we just applied to Harvard for, uh, School of Public Health. And then we're also hoping to get some high sensitivity monitors at the CSNDC offices and at Talbert Bernard Senior Homes, which is right next to the Fairmont line. So as begin, we begin to gather data, citizen science essentially, and working with Earthwatch and working with um, <clears throat> Harvard uh, on this, we're trying to start to get information for, from folks about, again, what they're interested in. So this shows some of the, again, the networks that are out there uh, in terms of air quality. Um, Harvard and BU School of Public Health have recently in the last couple of years done an indoor air quality survey. Uh, indoor chest of the results should be coming out at some point soon. Um, but this just gives you, I couldn't put all this on one picture. Unfortunately, there are so many uh, connections. So this gives you another sense of a key issue is mental health. Mental health has been a huge issue in the face of COVID and we've been supported by the Codman Square Health Center and Climate Code Blue, which is a bunch of doctors from local hospitals trying to drill down on what, um, what issues there are and where we can support uh, residents in those issues. And then land, of course, is always um, a challenge. Who controls land? Who gets that land? What can that land become? Whether it's a way to address food insecurity or urban heat island effect uh, or increase the tree canopy. So we're really trying to figure out if there are more ways to get more residents control of land. And last but not least, um, they say it takes a village. Uh, this, this is a sense of the network that we've had to create to do this work. So I'd say it's more like a small town at least at this point. And with that, I'll, I'll close and thank you. Great, thank you, Dave. Um, you've generated quite a few questions in the chat. So we will <clears throat> move on to, to Jeannie and then uh, take the audience questions. Thank you so much. I'm humbled to be a part of this amazing panel and I'm really excited to learn about um, the work that's going on. Uh, today, I'm going to share about the resilience projects that Climable is working on in a few Boston area neighborhoods. I'm going to talk about how those fit into three themes, um, technical translation, overcoming barriers, and how we put community first. I'm gonna emphasize the importance of longstanding trusting relationships. And Climable's focus is on the climate crisis, but I'm gonna to briefly touch on two other crises. So um, air raids in Barcelona and the COVID crisis in Boston. Next slide. Bos Barcelona was being bombed by fascists in the late 1930s. Um, this picture is of a neighborhood called Plaza Diamante that for over a hundred years at that time had already been participating in this festival Festa de Gracia, and um, that one block, their focus was decorating all the streets around. So each block would coordinate for a whole year, planning the most extravagant and original decorations, and it was a competition. When the air raids started in um, 1936, 1938, they, um, there were 1,400 communities in Barcelona building air raid shelters, each for their own community. This neighborhood completed the excavating and constructing of their air raid shelter in half the time of the others. And that is because they had this long history of working closely together. Uh, next slide. Um, more recently, the Barr Foundation funded a study by uh, Nina Strayalona and Penn Lowe. They The team talked with 30 uh, individuals at a variety of organizations about the response to co the COVID crisis. Um, a major finding was that the strongest and most impactful efforts were those coordinated by individuals and organizations who were part of pre-existing networks with other individuals and organizations. To me, these are two really powerful examples of how building longstanding trusting relationships can impact outcomes. Cranville is a woman-run nonprofit working to provide clear, understandable climate and energy materials for the public with a focus on vulnerable populations. We're currently laying the groundwork for clean energy microgrids in Chelsea, Chinatown, and the Port neighborhood in Cambridge. Next slide. 
we work collaboratively. This is uh, one example of a team that um, includes technical experts and community groups. And we really um, love to iterate and listen and really uh, make sure that the community members are in the lead so that we can answer the problems that are directly affecting each neighborhood that we work with. So um, three, three things that guide our work. So the technical translation piece is really key. If you can imagine a clean energy microgrid and what that sounds like to energy professionals, there's a lot to it. Distributed energy resources, how, who owns the assets, who operates them. So if you don't work in energy and you have a job and you're raising a family, it would be a lot to ask a person to scale that super steep learning curve and understand how can my neighborhood benefit from, from this kind of work? Um, so what Carnival does, we break it down into in really manageable chunks. We think that climate uh, messages can be super overwhelming and make people shut down. And um, when we work with communities, we work, we go to stakeholder meetings and public meetings, and there are surveys, um, Zoom meetings and producing materials. Uh, next slide. So energy literacy is the first step. So this is a draft of um, the beginning of a slideshow we're working on with the city of Cambridge. And so we try to make the materials appealing and um, technically correct for sure, but uh, bite-sized pieces and, and breaking things down. The next slide is uh, something that it's not just technical translation, but it's translation into languages that community members speak. Um, it's super important. So this is um, one piece of information that is we're working on with the city of Chelsea electrifying city hall. It also exists in English and there are lots of other um, materials like this that we develop collaboratively with the communities to say what will, what will speak to people and what are the assets that are actually needed. So, Overcoming barriers. All right. Um, there are lots of barriers, financial barriers, regulatory barriers, transactional barriers. This is just a picture of how our clean energy microgrids work. And um, the one transactional barrier, people have heard of um, the New England electricity market. There are revenues that are available when you're a big player um, and, you, and, and you can participate in the market. But these smaller installations really can't benefit from that. And it's really important for everyone to benefit from the clean energy transition. Um, so we aggregate our, our participants um, or, and, and hope to eventually participate in the clean energy in the New England electricity market. Uh, financial barriers are huge. The reason that campuses and industrial, uh, industrial buildings have microgrids is because they make a lot of sense. They make economic sense but you have to have upfront capital. Um, a lot of the neighborhoods and the landlords and building owners uh, do not. And so we're working on the financial models that can work to get these clean assets into communities. And regulatory barriers. A lot of policy has to change. Um, meanwhile, we're not, we're not waiting for that. So while a utility mandate may say that we can't cross rights of way at, to connect our buildings, we're just making sure that each building has building level resilience. So batteries, solar panels, backup generation. And eventually, yes, we'd love to connect our, our microgrids across the whole city of Chelsea, if possible, across all of Chinatown and elsewhere. Um, the, the last theme is community, putting community first. So we only work in neighborhoods that want to work with us and have groups that have bandwidth to work with us. So it's been a major problem finding um, places because we don't, we don't have funding um, per se. And so to ask a community group, hey, can, can, do you have a staff person who can spend a ton of time running this stuff with us and working alongside us? But the, the bottom-up approach that we have it is essential. So top-down might work for some situations, but it is really hard to incorporate the needs of the community, um, because each community is different, when you have a kind of you know, one size fits all model, whether it's a utility or a developer or whoever has that plan. Um, 
So the bottom up approach, again, it has the community groups in the decision making role, 100%. So um, it's led to better outcomes. And uh, so one example is we um, were applying for a grant together. And one of the questions that we put in the grant was, would we have be able to collect data and use um, controllable thermostats and things like that. And there was a building um, manager that said they had to drop out of the program with us because they were not allowed, I think by state law, to have um, the thermostats and things adjusted by an outside party, which is part of what you know peak shaving requires in, in some situations. So rather than them dropping out, we said, well, we don't have to do that. I mean, it's a small example, but it's that kind of iteration. The plan is often changing in response to, to local needs. Um, I don't know if I have, I think, yeah, I have other slides. You can just um, advance. So um, this is the, the piece about energy democracy. We want an ownership of assets to stay in the community, operation of assets to stay in the community um, with the tr transition to clean energy. All of these benefits can't just flow to the bigger owners. Um, it just isn't fair. And let's see, um, I'm trying, I, I love the question and answer part. So I'm gonna wrap. The, um, human the human dimensions of these big infrastructure projects are often overlooked in planning. And yet the infrastructure is meant to serve the people. So this trust building is a long and slow and hard process. It takes time and um, that is the message. It, my message today is basically that it's worth it. It's, it's necessary. So please take the time to build those trust building relationships and follow us. And um, I'm looking forward to questions. Thanks. Great. Thank you to the three of you. Um, fascinating presentations and really good to hear of this good work going on in Boston. Um, let me start with a question for all three of you. And this is um, in our chat from Josh Aldador. It has to do with green gentrification. And so whether it's the, the five communities where you're doing um, heat island work or Dave's greening or your microgrids, what specific actions are you taking or will you be taking to prevent gentrification from happening in those communities? Um, for us, you know, in the Eco Innovation District, um, I mentioned it's about 13 blocks and we, we were lucky in that we've owned about two thirds of the vacant land in that area. And so because of that, we were able to build as we do affordable housing, rental housing and home ownership opportunities. But I think what happens is if developers, you know, for for profit developers get into places like that, then they begin to control the narrative, prices go up. Um, so we've been very lucky in that we've been able to just prevent that by through land ownership. But I think that leads to a larger question is again, I, and I mentioned in my talk, who owns the land and who gets to control what happens to it. And so putting more um, property in the in the hands of a land trust that's citizen led. And I don't think this exists um, in any major way yet, um, but I think it's coming um, so that residents can have more of control over what happens to that land is I think critical. So that's my two cents. Thank you. So I I do want to agree with Dave and, and there are actually um, two land trusts that exist currently. There is uh, a land trust um, not too far from where I grew up in um, the Dudley Street neighborhood area and a new, a relatively newer land trust in the Chinatown neighborhood area, um, really in response to exactly this. Um, so, I, you know, I, I will say the city doesn't have all the solutions around how we deal with this. I think in many instances, a lot of times, um, land is in private hands and there's limits to what the city can do. However, um, I do know, uh, and I've had, it's been great to have some conversations with the Department of Neighborhood Development. Um, it's one of the groups I met with very early in my tenure, um, really to understand what, what they're doing and how are we 
aligning. Um, and what, one of the things I think is really key is, is the mayor said, we don't need to develop every single piece of land in the city. Um, and so um, naming that something should be out of the mix for development. Um, I think that's really important because if we develop every single piece of land, it's going to get hotter. Um, the challenge that uh, around that is um, it does, it is the right thing to do and it simultaneously puts pressure on the housing market. And so we actually have to have a real conversation. There's a lot of tension about density, um, about what we do. So I think both um, setting up land trusts that keep things permanently affordable and then thinking about um, if we're going, if more people want to live here than we have land for, how do we really look at um, the kind of density that does not uh, increase our heat? And if that's not an easy like trade-off um, to make, I, I, I want to be honest that I wish I had like very <laughs> easy solutions around this, um, but I think it, it does at least begin with naming the reality of gentrification, getting concrete about what we want to do about it, and then um, doing as much as we can to put things um, that are permanently affordable and therefore cannot be uh, whisked away or bought away. Because uh, at times, you know, I, I live in Dorchester, it do, at times it does feel like the city is just being sold to the high, highest bidder. Um, and figuring out how to turn the tide back on that um, is challenging, but it, it will take bold strategies and a lot of cooperation um, between uh, residents and government. Jamie? Yes, um, agreed. The cooperation is is just such a huge part of this. Um, and I would say that in, in our case, um, a couple of examples, the, the, uh, the displacement that happens in climate emergencies is one of those things that can contribute to gentrification. People have to move out, the buildings are upgraded, and then they can't, people can't afford the rents anymore. So our model focuses on prosper in place. And so um, in the buildings where we work, we want people to have the backup generation for keeping medicines cold and keeping, you know, keeping a safe building, and then therefore not having to move out in the first place in an emergency. Another quick example is, um, really just working with the community on the specific designs. And so electric vehicles can be a part of a plan for resilience. When we were working with Chelsea, we said, okay, if we had an electric fleet that was shareable and uh, you know, had the EV chargers in, in all over, that was uh, nixed pretty quickly. You know, if you have EV chargers, who can afford a brand new car? It's going to lead to gentrification. So we're talking about electrifying the municipal fleet. So still the benefits can go to the community, but we, we don't, we, we listen, adapt um, and fight it. Okay. Um, you all three talked about participation in different ways. Um, Jeannie, you talked about a bottom-up strategy. Dave, you talked about um, community science initiatives and Chief Whiteham and you, told us about the five sessions you're having in the communities for community input. So I'd like to, to look at that theme for a little bit here. Um, Boston has been criticized in the past for um, not, not really getting um, meaningful participation, what we call authentic participation. So now that you're on the inside, I'd like to hear a little more from you, um, Chief White Hammond on how you want to change that and then from the two of you what you think needs to happen to make um, a truly bottom-up community-driven approach to how we address climate in the cities. Yeah so um, you know I think so first my, it starts from my, my theory of change which is um, we need a revolution in the way that we live um, there's no tinkering around the edges. Nobody's gonna come in and give us some one great technology that's gonna fix this. We are talking about a radical shift in how we live. That's scary at times, but I also find it exciting because from my perspective, the way we've been living is not that great. Um, there are some folks who've been 
perpetually at the bottom. And um, I'm not interested in maintaining the system as it currently is. And I don't think tinkering around the edges is the way to fix it. So part of what the conversation I have with, with my staff is um, we can do really great work. I hope that we do you know, exactly what we said we were gonna do and we're gonna, you know, you know, people will think we use resources well and we, we're creating good debt. But the reality is to get where we need, we actually need a movement beyond City Hall <laughs> to drive the shifts that we need because politically, the kind of money that needs to be invested, um, the kind of shifts that are required are never gonna come from an you know, inside game exclusively. So what I see our work is a um, couple things. One, making sure that people have the information. Because I think a lot of folks in Boston don't yet know how vulnerable we are, don't yet know the future that we're looking at. And if people don't even know what's happening, how do they rise up and begin to do something about it? So we do have access to data. We've been able to bring in experts. We've been able to sort of look at what's really happening. And we need to make sure that information is flowing out so that people um, can look at that and say, wait, what? We need to do something about it. Um, because I think we're only gonna change at the scale we need when it's demanded or by residents and not ever is it gonna flow out of City Hall. Um, the second thing I think we need to do is where we do have resources and we are doing things, how do we, um, want, again, make sure that people have the information, right? Like a lot of folks know what's hot but haven't known for sure. The maps we've created have given people the ability to speak um, from what they are experiencing and know that, that that is backed up by data, but then also engage people and asking both how do we use the city's resources and how could we align those resources with stuff that folks are doing in the community? Um, and sometimes how do we just get resources out in the community for the ideas that people are having um, and need some, some resources to jumpstart? So um, in the interim, while I wait for the movement to move at the, at the scale of, of the urgency, um, how are we creating alternatives right here and right now that allow people to dream what the different world that we need might look like and start experimenting towards it. Um, start thinking, how could I reduce air pollution right here in my neighborhood? What's a creative strategy? How can I talk to my neighbors? And then to know that we have some resources to help you get there. They're not huge. They're not gonna allow you to turn everything around, but they are gonna allow you to have an idea and have some resources to get started. Um, but I, I do think at the end of the day, um, the shift we need has to be demanded by people. And, and the idea that we um, are gonna make it happen, uh, for me, that conflicts with my theory of change of how real change happens. But I, I am here to be a facilitator as best I can um, to give folks that access to information to do what little, you know, sort of the, the pieces that we're gonna do um, in the best possible way. Um, and, and to be an ally and an alignment um, with that, that movement. I think the other layer of this is policy um, needs to say the folks that have done the best, the folks that have benefited from the boom economy should get out in front first. Those are the folks that should be asked to make the sacrifices. I, you know, I much love, I've gotten a lot of, you know, lobbying already and letters and things from like the real estate community. But I know that the things we're asking for in the performance standards are not going to cause people not to be able to eat at night. That is what's going to happen if we ask our most vulnerable residents to take the heat first. It will have an impact on their health and safety and their livelihood. So the deepest sacrifice needs to be made by those who have already received the most benefits. And I do think that City Hall um, can say, we will have policies that ask the folks who have done the best to bear the greatest burden. Interesting, okay. Jeannie or David? Sure, I can jump in. Um, may, this might sound crass, money, money's the answer. Uh, 
So when we started our work and we were approaching various um, organizations, especially in the Green Justice Coalition to see if they wanted to work with us, there's an organization that has a real presence in Roxbury, in Lower Roxbury and Mattapan and Dorchester that has a history of working in energy. And their question to me was, do you have funding? If we could have a half person time to work on this, yes, we would love to work with you. Um, and we, we didn't. Um, there was a grant opportunity that we did take advantage of. Um, and it was for community microgrid work. 100% of that funding was supposed to go to the technical team. And yet the title was community microgrid. And we ended up splitting the money 50-50 with the communities doing a lot of pro bono work, which we're super happy with, but that's a flaw in the system. How do you give that money and say, oh, we just got to pay the engineers. We just, you know, we love our engineers, but come on. Um, these costs should be socialized. Everyone benefits, right? So why can't it be uh, carbon price? Why can't it be utility funded? I mean, there's a lot of extra, you know, in some of these models that we, um, that people should be benefiting from. And um, I mean, foundations are doing a lot. We could, you know, foundation funding. I think it's really, um, it's a, it's, sorry, simple answer, but hard to achieve. Great, Dave? Um, yeah, for for us, it's really, um, you know, the question is, you know, how can we make change from the bottom up? And for us, it's really been, as I, I think I touched on this, residents kind of having a seat at the decision-making table, really having them really at the tables where the decisions made, are getting made. So, for example, we've been advocating out of the um, uh, climate bill, uh, the roadmap bill, there are a number of, number of different initiatives. And so one of them, for example, is involved in um, the Mass Community Energy Center gets $12 million a year out of this bill for job creation. So we've been advocating very strongly for a seat when they're making the programs up themselves, like when, is, when they're actually creating the programs to address this legislative mandate, who's making the decisions? And so we're really pushing hard on that. Um, and so for us, it's really about getting people at the table. I think that's the, that's the main thing. Um, and then Chief Hammond, uh, White Hammond mentioned uh, policy change. So we're also trying to look at places we can plug in on policy change, whether that's at the city level or state level as well. So. Great. So um, we talked about buildings a little bit and the building performance standard and you know, the, the move on that, that that Boston is taking, which is, which is impressive. Um, one of one of our attendees, Frank Stone, mentions about building performance standards for residential buildings. So that if you base it on square foot targets, um, what you have is larger buildings housing fewer people uh, have lower per square energy foot emissions level. Um, so in a way, it's the opposite of what you were talking about, Chief White Hammond, in that it's wealthy residents are allowed to pollute more than poorer residents. So um, what do we see happening in terms of how we're thinking specifically, just say about residential requirements so that um, we can turn that. So as you said, as the folks that have done the best should be asked to make this the biggest sacrifice. I mean, so I think what I, you know, I would love to hear more folks um, engagement. I think it would be great if folks have the, it is now out um, and I'll put the link in the chat in a moment for you to look at the um, new Berto ordinance um, and it's an update to the previous ordinance but puts sort of more clarity around targets. Part of the reason that we are starting this, this conversation this way um, is that we are actually focusing um, on our largest buildings um, and that's um, because we think that way, first of all, they're the larger emitters and um, and also um, have a lot of options <laughs> for how they can shift. Part of the reason that it does not currently include some of our smaller buildings and some of our um, sort of smaller residences um, is because we do want to um, make sure that we are um, not asking those folks who are struggling to, to meet that. And so usually our larger buildings are not owned <laughs> by um, our uh, sort of most vulnerable, lowest income uh, folks. But I mean, I'm more than willing to, to um, have a deeper conversation. 
I do know that we have both opportunities and constraints um, in terms of what the city itself can do. Um, I think folks know um, there was a big push in an attempt to make the state's regulations um, mandatory and they were instead um, voluntary. Um, that's, that's not particularly helpful. <laughs> and because there are lots of kinds of regulation of, of um, buildings that are actually outside of the city's um, purview. So I think what we've tried to do is sort of say, let's start with our biggest emitters. What we happen to know about our biggest emitters is that they are not usually owned by our lowest uh, income folks. Um, and let's figure out uh, how we get them on the track that Boston says it's going. Um, and then yes, at some point we're gonna have to bring uh, everyone in. Um, but again, we're, put it, we're asking those folks to go first. We also do have a um, hardship clause in there. If there are folks that truly, uh, for instance, have much higher occupancy than other folks, it's really sh a struggle, um, there's some space in there. But what I will say is that hardship means actual hardship. So, um, you know, it means you've got to come to us and be able to say, why um, your particular building, maybe it's older um, and there's some real, real challenges there, or like you're saying, it's a high occupancy and it, it, that poses some challenges. Um, we have tried to incorporate in that an opportunity for folks to talk to us about why they might have particular challenges. Um, and I think that that is an attempt um, to, to pay attention to instances where um, you might have a building that, that has uh, some real, um, where some of the upgrades could mean a, a challenge in affordability. Um, so that, that I think there's space for that. I do also think we have to keep pushing to make sure that the playing field um, and the regulations that are set by the state are also matching what the state says it wants to do and not just voluntary. Okay, anyone else on that? Okay, in talking about greening spaces in, in the neighborhoods that you're focusing on, here, one aspect of that is community gardens, taking it bigger, uh, food deserts, regional food systems. Um, can any of you speak to what you're doing uh, to connecting the different aspects of what you're doing to creating um, or helping to eliminate food deserts? Yeah, and I think that um, speaks to Josh's question. So I wanna to try to answer that um, from my perspective. Um, so I mentioned we have a 20,000 square foot uh, urban agriculture site and we've been giving away and selling food in the neighborhood. And I think we're moving towards having a community supported agriculture program set up. Now that we were able to grow four seasons, we now have a huge hoop house uh, that allows us to grow indoors uh, during the winter. But the other thing that's started to happen is that um, our community organizing team really got people to speak up um, around healthy food. And so they pushed uh, the local food market to provide more healthy food. So now when you walk into America's Food Basket, which is the only supermarket in the neighborhood, you'll see off to your left, um, healthier food. Fruit is right there, uh, along with fruit, fruity, I'm putting this in quotes, fruity drinks, um, uh, which are healthier than whatever was uh, being sold before. So they've started to really speak up and speak out um, and then, and are feeling more empowered to deal with some of the health issues related to food. Um, there's also been pushback. So right now, Codman Square doesn't have a hardware store, doesn't have a flower shop. It only recently gained a coffee shop. So some of the things that you think of as being in a normal neighborhood, it's gained those things only recently. But for a long time, we've had a McDonald's. For a long time, we've had a Kentucky Fried Chicken. Um, and there's a lot of Caribbean food. If you want great Caribbean food, come to Codman Square. We've got that covered. But um, there was recently a push to put in, um, I think it was, uh, not Church's Fried Chicken, what is it? Um, one of those fried chicken chains. And people just said, we don't really want that. We've got enough there. So folks are able to push back and at least stall that for the time being. Um, so that started to happen a bit. Great. Anyone else on that? 
Okay. I, I can say just really quickly, I, I think it's also worse than this is not my department. We, um, we are partnering much more um, with other departments around issues of food, but Department of Neighborhood Development has um, a program that's been moving city land um, to creative, um, you know, community uses. And one of the priorities is for food production. And so when you look at places like Oasis on Blue and the work that's happening with Urban Farm Institute, we wanna make sure that more of those kind of entities that are um, growing food right in the neighborhood, healthy food, um, and teaching people how to grow. Um, many of us, somewhere in our past, um, there were folks worked the land, but lots of us have forgotten that. And so um, I do know that, that uh, folks who are wanting to do food enterprises are actually prioritized in the city. There's a whole food access plan that really looks at um, how do we make sure, one, that people have enough food, but the other is um, making that sure that food is healthy and, this, and the, the, that third layer of how could it also be uh, a contributor to the local economy and to the local sort of mental health and sustainability that it, it feels awesome to know um, that your food comes from your neighborhood. So I wanna give a quick shout out to the Dorchester Food Co-op, um, which is in the process of, of um, establishing the, uh, the first food co-op in our neighborhood. I think I was num member number 47 and we've passed a thousand members at this point, um, but it's an example of, of folks in a neighborhood um, deciding that, that we deserve to have an amazing co-op and they'll be able to buy food, fresh produce directly from Oasis on, on Baloo, which means the food will be grown in our neighborhood and being available to, to us as neighbors to purchase. So I think there's a lot of good work um, happening in this, in this area. Yeah, and that hyper-local approach, I think you noted, Chief, um, keeps that money in the neighborhood too, which is critical. Absolutely. So maybe we're going to end with a little more technical question related to, to Jeannie's um, work about um, where, where there's a big strategy in Massachusetts as, as well as Boston on electric vehicles, electrification of fleets and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, is there any work going on with the microgrid about vehicle to grid? Um, this is a question from the audience here. Uh, Bi-directional charging? Uh, for electric vehicles as a way to think about grid resilience and security. I know they're doing this in Amsterdam and, and um, Los Angeles and other areas, but I, I haven't heard anything about Boston. Um, it's definitely something we talk about. So I mentioned the proposal to have an electrified municipal fleet in Chelsea. And the idea would be that those vehicles would have V to G technology because in Chelsea, we're work, working closely with the municipal government and the municipal buildings, and those vehicles could serve as the backup batteries for the shelters that um, would be in the municipal, in the municipal buildings. And so um, we haven't. So that's kind of the extent of of our work specifically on that question. Um, I wanted to just give a really quick plug for some work though, because I know we're focusing on Boston, but if people watched the first series in this series, um, you heard Maria Belen Power talk about the burdens that fall on Chelsea for all of the great um, services that they give to the greater Boston area. Uh, there are some people at Northeastern working on a debt calculator and that they're using gratitude-based approach to figure out what are those services that other communities are um, providing for the people of Boston or elsewhere. They're, they're doing it all over the country actually, or they're starting piloting it. So um, anyway, I just wanted to put that plug in there because it, uh, it closely relates, I think, to, to all of this work. Okay. Well, thank you all of you. This has been a most informative uh, panel with a highly engaged audience and uh, I'll turn it over to you, Amy. Great. Well, thank, thank you um, from me as well and from the GRC. This is just a really rich and uh, inspiring sort of view into all of the projects and all of the innovative work that's going on all over the city. So thank you to Chief Reverend Mariama White-Hammond, um, to David Queeley, Jeannie Ramey, and of course, thank you, extra thank you to you, Joan. Professor Joan Fitzgerald for moderating and thanks to the Slowey McManus team behind the scenes making all this happen. Um, we're glad you could join us today. You will get a link to the program and the slides and I also will try to, there were a lot of um, 
programs, links, meeting notices sort of talked about, we'll try to capture all those for you as best we can. Um, next to GRCX programs, we don't have dates yet, but we are working on rescheduling the one we had to postpone on accelerating the decarbonization of the wholesale energy market. That should be end of June, very early July. And then uh, a little later in July, a program on um, how different perspectives on time affect our responses to climate change, which I am really fascinated by. So thanks for coming and we'll see you all soon.